many people working in this space now are old enough to remember the internet from the 90s and they remember it fondly because it was this completely open, chaotic, and I, mean, I don't want to say ungoverned world, but at least it was open to everyone. And we've seen it over the years get more and more centralized. We've seen these giants emerge, like the Google and Facebook and Apple and Twitter and Airbnb, but all of these like really centralizing, humongous companies that um, sort of colonized this, this space. When we talk about we want to decentralize it, it's really we just want to get it back to the way it was supposed to be. Back in 2011, many people were Bitcoin maximalists, but I was on the contrary. I, I thought that there would be four or five coins that would be very different in their niches, their, their markets, and all of them will, will three. One was a smart contract based uh, cryptocurrency, exceptionally for smart contracts. Another one was that boosted uh, the privacy. And another one was a, pay, a very good payment network. And the third and the last one was a settlement layer of a kind of gold. You have choice with these cryptocurrencies to use whichever one you want. And more valuable, things, yeah. more valuable ones will, will rise to the top. But I, I don't think you're going to have a monopolistic situation like you do with government funded monopolies. As soon as you, you, you direct in, into a certain company, they then ride these monopolies. They don't innovate because they don't have to because they're monopolies and then they eventually get disrupted like you're seeing in the payment sector with banks and eventually credit cards and things like that. And then you're going to see it now with Ethereum's, with, with lawyers, you're going to see it with insurance companies, you're going to see it with anything else could be disintermediated now by automated technology that's going to remove value added, non-value added people from the equation. And that's what Ethereum is going to enable. When the technology first arose and when I first heard of Ethereum, I was immediately captured by the power behind it, this ability to completely democratize the space again. It was just too exciting, a mixture of math, politics, economics, and, you know, nice and subversive. And, you know, I love the idea behind it. Ethereum started the smart contract revolution. Uh, Bitcoin has smart contracts as well, but they are very limited. Uh, Ethereum started life as a way to remove those limitations and see where uh, universal programs running on, on blockchains with the cryptocurrencies would take us. Well, Ethereum is like Bitcoin 2.0. It's mostly made for transferring value, but you can add some small instructions, some, some tiny conditions on when transactions occur. The result of this is that what we have now is a, a system uh, where we can have pieces of software, software programs which can handle money by themselves autonomously. So they cannot be stopped by people. They can just, you can put the software on the blockchain. Anybody can call the functions of the software and it will be executed. So 2014, I started looking at what are the interesting projects that are getting this exciting stuff about programmable money and they are trying to take it beyond, right? The background to Ethereum, at least from where from, uh, from my point of view, is the, uh, the social aspect of it. I was ready to join any of those communities, and the Ethereum community is what brought me into the conversation. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a UI and UX designer. But I was very interested in Bitcoin for smart contracts, and then I started reading about Ethereum. And when the opportunity came, it just had to, to come and help. And then they started talking about the whole idea of Look, we don't need to be just a smart contract platform. We can re literally use everything else in the tech stack to build a next generation web, right? A new web. Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the modern internet as a whole are all a result of uh, early developments in the World Wide Web and JavaScript, the programming language of the World Wide Web from the 1990s. Similarly, by providing a universal programmable blockchain and packaging it up into a client that anyone can use. The Ethereum project hopes to do the same for finance, peer-to-peer -peer commerce, distributed governance, and human collaboration as a whole.
I think we're incredibly lucky to have someone like Vitalik as the figurehead of the ecosystem. He's extremely pragmatic. He's not prone to extremist points of view. It's amazing how well he writes, especially given his age. Apart from the fact that he's obviously a very creative person, right? A person who understands things. He also has this, this talent for communicating his ideas. That combined with being like this extremely brilliant cryptographer and then the system thinker, I think uh, we're extremely lucky that that's the case. I think the Bitcoin Ethereum parallel is very interesting because Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have a figurehead that people are willing to follow along. And so that provides certain benefits, one of which is um, it has substantial, more obvious resilience. Satoshi's great achievements, I think they were twofold. First, inventing Bitcoin itself and then disappearing. You know, in Ethereum's case, it's the, it's the foundation, and in the foundation we have, you know, basically Vitalik, which a lot of people feel makes good decisions. Some people say jokingly, it's uh, Ethereum works based on proof of Vitalik. <laughs> I think this is perhaps a stretch, but it, it goes to say that he does have an influence. So people look to him and his opinions matter in, in Ethereum. It's very important. We don't focus on the people. We don't focus on, oh, we are doing everything because Vitalik is a super intelligent guy. We have a lot of very, very intelligent guys that we don't talk about. There is a, a reliance on these figures when you're building a decentralized network, which is a, a slightly more negative thing because you want that resilience. Part of the reason of decentralization is really resilience. If you take a node out, the others are still there. These things, if it's going to be around for hundreds of years, you don't have to weather through its reliance on specific people and specific institutions. You want a system in which your ideas can live on with other people because you're providing them tools to build something. There is a problem to having a single leader, you know, that this leader can be, you know, co-opted to, to do something or pushed to, 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 to propose anything. But the positiveness of that is, is that you can accelerate faster and improve things faster. It makes it easier for the this disparate group of people to come to consensus on changes, whether it's contentious or not. Which I think is a very useful thing, especially at this point in, in the, the infrastructure. It is a very new space, and I think none of us really know where this is going or what the first really you know, kicker products will be. So we're experimenting with those things that are new, those things we can do now that we couldn't do before. The one thing we have that we can already start playing with is this consensus engine. So it's natural people start uh, experimenting with uh, governance issues, anything where you previously need a power hierarchy and some central oracle, the blockchain to get consensus on something. When decentralizing things, uh, you, don't, you lose that control, so you have to make something that works autonomously. Now you can make systems for people to, to make decisions together, to decide about policy, but the structure, the framework, the rules wherein that those decisions are made, you have to decide beforehand, and you cannot go back. So, uh, and this is really hard, and it's hard also because um, nobody has ever really done this yet. Lots of people talk about governance, governance on the blockchain, but I haven't seen anything that works yet, and uh, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe something radically different needs to be done. The reason I, I have some skepticism in here is that we all remember the DAO, right? One of the things that DAO demonstrated is not that people shouldn't trust the code, but actually, more importantly, that you need to get people interested in making decisions, right? Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. The DAO hack was an intense moment. I was here in Sao Paulo one week giving a talk about everything that we were going to do with this and how this was a bright, shining example of our technology. And then, in a better a few hours, that shiny example of technology will probably live forever as a shiny example of a disaster that went on. The DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, didn't work out 
the first time it was attempted, but it came really close. And when you think about it, it was a fairly small thing that caused it to uh, not be successful. The DAO was envisioned as some sort of mechanism so that people could pay in Ether, and this Ether could be used to sponsor projects, and if the projects ended up becoming profitable, people would be able to make some of those profits back. What happened was, um, due to a technical flaw in this the DAO, in this piece of software, in this website that sits on top of Ethereum, someone was able to attack it and to drain about a third of the money that the DAO had managed to collect into a kind of a, 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 an offspring of the same the same sort of thing but an offspring if you think about a stress test i couldn't think about a better one than this one like uh, everything that could go wrong actually went wrong so you had the these nasty fights between the community you had like a uh, uh, divergences this uh, led to a situation in which the uh, Ethereum community discussed what to do. So they actually changed the code to uh, disregard this part of the history. So one faction of the network went along just fine, and other faction unwound the history, went back in time, so to speak, and continued from a point where the uh, Robbery had not happened. I don't think the disagreements in the community are an existential risk. I think that is very healthy to disagree, especially about such difficult topics. And they turn out not even to be like a financial risk. I mean, one of the things that was interesting to me with the Ethereum Classic fork is that the the value of both tokens, of the, let's say, the old token and the new one, combined was slightly higher than the original one. Lots of people say the DAO showed that uh, these distributed models of the firm, firms with no people, just don't work. I drew the opposite conclusion. I said, wow, if they just not had that flaw in the smart contract software, this thing would have been the most amazing new business model ever created. You know, an organization that can raise $160 million and has the, the programming to be able to do things with that money that could move the ball forward. So don't throw away the baby with the, the bathwater. There's a real baby here, and it's one that needs to be um, protected with better software. A smart contract is incredibly powerful and you're going to deploy it and if the type of smart contract is built in such a way that you can't change it, you have to accept that this thing won't be able to be fixed. And so that mindset is very difficult. So you have to approach some of parts of the code more like ro building ro actual rocket code. Like this is not something that you can just, you know, cowboy code over the weekend and hey, bam, presto, here's this thing and there's bugs in there, who cares? kind of thing. But over time, considering that it's literally code with money in, uh, the attack vectors are very obvious if you know what you're doing. There's going to be code with money in it, it's going to be hacked, it's going to be fixed. On the Multiseek hack, I was uh, actually deep dive into it, just looking around uh, in real time in the security channel. It was a really crazy moment to see how fragile were those funds and how easy uh, a non fully verified code can generate such uh, chaos. It's going to be more code with more money in it. It's going to be hacked. It's going to be fixed. We released an update uh, pretty fast. I think within about an hour, we'd 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 patch the the hole so that um, versions of Parity were, were no longer vulnerable. The White Hat group was fast in their reaction. They very quickly mounted a sort of classic Robin Hood counterattack um, and uh, kind of repatriated everybody's funds uh, from the. Um, uh, from the wallets that were vulnerable. I think it was a good episode that shows how sometimes a strong and good community can really be the most important aspect of, of the ecosystem. Everyone in multiple teams trying to help and everyone was able to come together and, and save this terrible thing from becoming something much, much bigger. And I think it shows the power of just being able to get a community together. While we're going through sort of these growing pains of figuring out where the pitfalls are, 
and how these developers are making these errors, we just keep having to patch them on every side. So over time, you're going to build this incredibly robust code base that could be regarded as probably the most resilient and strongest code base in the world. My initial thoughts were really, wow, this space has really figured it out how to kind of raise funds. The traditional model of investment uh, made us kind of blind about how much money there is actually in the world. And for some reason, people led to believe that there is very, very little money. We've always been taught that it's really super hard to get investment. But what ICO is showing you is that it's not. I personally think that ICOs are one of the most boring things that you can do, do with Ethereum. And I really hope that um, phase ends quickly.